I'm happy to be here because we live in a complicated time. So first off, unlike you as a teacher in a regular classroom or regular conference setting, you need to get out your phones and or laptops for this talk because we're going to do a little bit of work together. Now, the truth is, uh, I'm actually a professional AI guy. And so when I was a student, I studied first order predicate logic like this. And the reason I bring that up is it's kind of, a, it's a real way of framing epistemology, which is a fancy word that says, how do you know what you know? Now, we live in a time of sort of endless contextual arguments and universal brouhaha. And you know what I'm talking about. How do you know what's true? How do you know what's a fact? How do you know what's to believe what you can believe in? So the thing I want to bring to you from epistemology is, you know, there's a whole pile of epistemological theory. Ignore that. Not useful today. What is useful is to think about what we read and what we write, what our students hear and take in, is a set of assertions. So each one of those lines up there is an assertion. And the truth value of that assertion is something that's determined contextually, possibly later, and it may possibly change, right? What is Zaire, for example? How many planets are there? Are there nine or eight? Depends on when you ask, right? Zaire used to be a country in Africa. It's not anymore. It's just a memory. So truth values change over time. So I want to decouple this notion of fact from assertion, right? You can assert anything. And the factual validity of that, the truth value of that is something separate. Because, remember this? Yeah, what color is that? It depends, right? It depends on the context. It depends on who you are. It depends on the background. It depends is the answer. There is no single truth value for that white or black, gold or blue, yellow or turquoise, whatever, right? It turns out that truth is a difficult thing. And in particular, I think Snopes has it right. When they sometimes evaluate statements or stories they read by saying it's a mixture, right? Truth is complicated. Facts are even more complicated. But I think the notion that you can have truth as a mixture of truth values is an interesting notion. So the truth is we think about credibility as being a reliable, trusted resource. But in truth, there's that word again. It is a subjective measure. For instance, credibility assessments change by topic, time, person, context, need. So for example, I trust my mother. My mother has huge credibility about things like child rearing or music or you know, the sentiments of Southern California. But quantum mechanics, not so much, right? So different people, different contexts, different times have different kinds of credibility. So, for example, there's a set of common beliefs that people have. .com is more credible than .org. .net is more credible than .com, you know, and so on and so on, right? One common misbelief is that Google search results are sorted by credibility. They're not. We don't know how to define credibility because we don't know your context, right? So, we might think, for example, that a site like scientificamerican.com is credible. But here's an interesting thing to know. If you type in, it's go to a main name server uh, salesperson, and you say scientificamericanstem.com, did you know you could buy that domain name for $2.99? Is that a credible site? You don't know, right? The bottom line is you can go off and buy all these domain names, .org, .net, .x, and so on, for small amounts of money and masquerade as Scientific American or your favorite congressperson or your favorite academic institution. It's not hard to do. So what's credible, what's authoritative, what's factual is a really interesting mix of all these different aspects of truth and of fact and of assertion. So here's a question for you. What's true? What I really wanted to talk about today, though, is how do we teach our students to figure this out? Right? You, the sage on the stage, the guy in the box talking, saying things that are more or less true, are a credible resource. How does a student know? How do they know? You might go, for example, and say, well, the films of Thomas Edison are a credible resource, especially when there's a ton of metadata for this film 
Thomas Edison shot, it's labeled here by the Library of Congress as being shot in Cuba about the Spanish-American War. Now this is actually fascinating because I'm going to, I'm going to sip, skip through this quickly. From the Library of Congress in Washington, yeah. D.C. Credible resource, right? Now watch, watch. So this is a recreation, no, excuse me. This was built as an incident in Cuba during the Spanish-American War, right? Now the thing about this is when you watch it, A, does the vegetation match Cuba? Huh, not really. B, the metadata says these sharpshooters are shooting over the body of dead horses. Now, this is, this is really fascinating. I'm gonna fast forward a little bit to here. Watch the horse on the far right. Oh, they got it. Thanks, Library of Congress. Um, it gets up at the end of the film. Yeah, we know. So now that you've got your phones out, I want you to start thinking about this question. What place did Mike Losey get in the Palo Alto Moonlight 5K run in 2017? Go ahead, start working on it while I give you, I'm gonna give you a minute to work on it. Because the reason I showed you that video, excuse me, that film, was it was actually filmed in New Jersey. Filmed in New Jersey, those are New Jersey pines in the background, and those were guys from Edison's lab recreating the incident that supposedly happened. So is Thomas Edison an incredible resource? Uh, not so much, right? So now I'm asking you this question here for two reasons. A, I gave you a minute, so we still got like 15 seconds to go, because that's more time than your students will take to answer a question. You know this is true. I know it's true because I can look at the search logs. I know that lots of student questions or student queries that come into Google because I know there's student queries because they're often two period space. What is the first, what is the root of this equation? You know, y equals x squared plus b, right? And so the fact that they put in the two dot means they're just copying it off the test, right? I can find millions of queries like that every day. And I also know then that people go, students in particular go in, do the search very quickly and they're done. Okay, who's got an answer, anybody? How many people used find on page or control F or anything, right? Okay, one person, okay. Real, my real question here is he's at the bottom of the page and so if you're on a Mac you would do that, command F. Or if you're on the other device you would do that, control F, right? Question for you, how many of you have never heard of control F or command F before? Anybody? So here's the thing. When I asked this in a larger setting, doing surveys of thousands of people, 90% do not know this. They do not know how to find text on a page. Are you as shocked as I am? That means 90% of your students do not know how to find text on a long page. When I ask English teachers in the US, half of them don't know this either. Excuse me? Half of them don't know this? This is important because when you discover that people don't know how to find text on a page and if it's a long page, they're screwed. They're gonna do visual search. Now, I did another study where I asked um, 85 people through a, a complicated study method to do this question, how long did it take him to run? See that? Um, there's a bunch of people like you over here on the left in that first spike at under 10, 15, 20 seconds. There's a bunch of people over here beyond 300 seconds. That's five minutes, right? What are they doing? They're searching by hand. They're scrolling through this, right? It's, it's crazy. Now, the fascinating thing about this is people who take more than 120 seconds, more than two minutes, a quarter of them get the answer wrong. You might wonder, how do you get the answer wrong, right? The reason is, I add, had them take the time, I actually asked how, how long did he take, take the time and put it into my survey form. Copy, paste, right? These people don't know that either. So they manually typed in the number they thought they saw. And it doesn't work well. People get errors all the time. And that's a, so we have a huge number of people, 90% of people don't know this fundamental search skill. If you're reading an ebook, say, from your favorite publisher, and you don't know how to do find on text, you do not know how to do things like this. So for example, if you're reading Alice's Adventure in Wonderland and search for Jabberwocky, you get zero hits. 
If you don't know how to do that, that's going to take you a long time to page every single page, right? So what you can do with this search skill, this search strategy, this search tactic, is discover that something is not there. You can prove the negative. How often in your life can you prove the negative? Not often. This is one way to do it. Question, the deeper question for us as STEM teachers, who taught you that? Do you remember? Probably not. The answer is nobody. You saw somebody else do it and you looked over their shoulder. That's how most people learn their search skills. Question to you, we as a field should be taking this, this challenge seriously. We should be figuring out how are our students learning to do online research? It's not part of the curriculum, right? So this becomes really important when we live in a world where increasing amounts of content are not just made up, but they're consciously fake. So here's a set of images. Just choose one you think is real. I assure you, half of these are real. Choose one you think is real. Now I'll show you the answers. Did you correct, correctly pick a real one? Or did you create it, uh, decide on a computer generated one? Did you get it right? This is particularly problematic because as you know, we live in an era where videos are becoming complicated objects. This is a video purportedly from CNN. Wait, why are you laughing? This is the Holy Father doing a miracle. Skeptics. Why are you skeptical, right? I mean, you have a lot of common sense about this, but how about this? You probably saw this movie. Which one was real? Which is the synthespian, right? And of course, you probably have seen this. I'm not going to show you the video. You can go look at it later. It's, it's linked to in the latest issue of Scientific American, actually, where there's this really, really nice article that links to that video, the Obama, fake Obama video. So it's that article. It's available in the hallway right now. That's right. And in the bag, right. My point is, we live in a world where this kind of stuff is not only increasing in volume and fidelity, it's coming more and more difficult for students, for us, to figure out what's BS and what's not. So what do you need to have? What do I teach my students to do? First, I teach them sort of an attitudinal thing. Question stuff that looks suspicious. Question stuff that doesn't look suspicious. How do you do that? Here's one thing that I, I've done. I often teach at uh, large conferences of teachers and, and English teachers, and I ask them this question. How many of you have read this book? How many of you have read this book? Right? Most of you, right? English teachers uniformly, they all have read this book. They teach this book. So question for you. What does the title mean? Almost uniformly, teachers will say, oh, this is about the Nautilus, right? It's that submarine and it's how deep it goes below the surface of the sea, okay? So I said, well, wait a second, what's a league? And they said, I don't know, it's some archaic unit of measurement. What is 20,000 of those? So let's look it up in Google, define it. It's a distance, about three miles. So what's 20,000 leagues in kilometers? It's 101,000 kilometers. Cool, the English teachers say. I like that, now I know it's 100,000 kilometers. Then I say, what's the diameter of the Earth? You have a problem. You did not understand the title of the book you're teaching. You didn't understand the first two words. What does that say about us as educators? So it's changing, you know, our technology, the availability of information online is changing the way we think, right? But while we've always taught critical thinking and critical resource and critical analysis as a, as a thing to do, it's really, I'm not kidding this time, it's really critical. Don't have time to do this, but I will walk you through it. If we had more time, just saying, if we had more time, I would ask you, what about this website, epafacts.com? The reason it comes up a lot is that it shows up in lots of student papers when they're writing about the EPA. They search for the EPA and they end up on this site. And you look at it, it's sort of funny. So you as an adult who knows about the EPA, the one, the true real EPA, 
the Plutonic EPA, right? They, you might wonder, why do they have transparency problems on their first page of EPA? Why is it EPA.com? But if you're in the sixth grade, you don't know that .gov is a thing. So that doesn't trickle your, your spidey senses at all, right? So if you go look at that site, their mission statement is they're in a project environmental policy alliance dedicated to highlighting the high cost of the environmental protection. What? If you're in sixth grade or seventh grade, again, that's like, okay, that seems fine to me. Let's go look at the other one, the EPA.gov. Their mission statement is a little different. It's an independent agency, blah, 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 right? So how do you as a student, how do you as a citizen, how do you figure out whether or not that's a credible site? You don't know how to do that. I'm not blaming you particularly. It's just, I, I think it's too easy to say, oh yeah, I'll, I'll do this, but I don't know how to actually do it, right? So here's an easier way. You could, for example, go and check the executives of each, each organization, find who they are. But here's an even easier way, which is they have their street address at epafax.com. It's 19, uh, 1090 Vermont Avenue, Suite 800. What's the address of epa.gov? Something different. But interesting, here, I'm going to put that street address into Google, just copy-paste what I have up there, into Google, and you'll find out very quickly that it is also the street address of this company, Berman & Co. Who are they? Doesn't take you long to figure out that they're actually a front for high-tech lobbying companies. They do a lot with big pharma, a lot with big ag, a lot with big oil. They are not the EPA, even though they represent themselves with an almost identical logo. So that's a really easy way to find that out. That's the true address of the true EPA.gov. Now, here's the thing that scares me. My colleague Sam Weinberg at Stanford has discovered that 80% of the students graduating from university cannot do what I just showed you. They cannot determine that that's a bullshit site. It's a lobbying site. That should scare you. It, what it means to me is that we're not teaching our students how to actually do online research, let alone chem research, right? Chemistry research is important. You have to learn those fundamental lab skills. Who is teaching the lab skills of online research, which everybody uses every day? We need to figure this out because we live in a world like this where you can go read the NewYorkTimes.com and discover that Warren endorses Sanders. Spoiler alert, this never happened. But there are sites that allow you to fake the presence and visual appearance of well-known, well-credible sites. It's hard to argue with Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> but if you're in the seventh grade, again, you may think that's totally plausible. Now, you probably have seen this website, treeoctopus.com, right? It is a spoof site, I'm telling you now. But our students need to not only know the tactics of search, but also the existence of consciously overt spoof sites. That's not so hard. That's pretty funny. Thousands of sixth graders write articles on this website every year. They don't get the joke. But a more scurrilous one is this one, dihydrogen monoxide, right? Think about that for a second. It's water. The thing that's difficult about this site, every assertion on this site is true in the extreme case. Yes, you can die from an overdose of dihydrogen monoxide, right? The overexposure to the, the altered crystalline state of this can also cause death, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's all true, but it's a joke. It's a spoof site. This is important because there's a community in Southern California that when they found this site, the city council banned the importation of dihydrogen monoxide, which really pissed off the water department. <laughs> How do you know? And why do so many people get fooled by this? So the last sort of tactic I think we need to be teaching is something like, like this. So here's an image. Again, if we had more time, I'd let you actually work on this. The best solution I've seen is I showed this in one, one class, and uh, some woman walked up with her phone and took a photograph of it. And using Google Photos said, where is this? You probably know where it is. But using Google Photos, it basically tells you this is Notre Dame. And once you've got that information, in Paris, not the other one, right? Just so you know, right? Once you know how to do that, all of a sudden, the way you think about search 
changes radically. There are new things happening all the time. And I'm going to run this a little bit, and I'll give you sort of background over, uh, voice over here. This is a little bit of the uh, Google Earth VR system. And the reason I'm showing you this is because the world is changing. The online information world is adding new capabilities, and so this runs now in our lab. So this is a VR system you can fly through, which is based on Earth imagery. And you can see she's got a wand-like pointer, and she's flying around, in this case, through Manhattan. You've probably seen that building. But now she grabs the sun and moves the sun backward in time. That's home. See what I'm saying? Unless you know how to navigate and use this for educational purposes, you could be in a world of hurt. So there are ways that I think we have reason to be optimistic. So I teach an online class, an online MOOC, um, called Power Search with Google, which teaches this stuff. And I've now passed over 4.1 million students. And this is the killer graph of the entire talk. This is showing you that uh, that period from September 3rd, you can barely see it, you see it in blue, that's when the class was being held. I tracked, what was it, 300,000 people or so after the class for two weeks, and you see that black line at top? When they came in, they were at 0.4. When they left, they exited two weeks later, they're at 1.4. I tripled their search skill, and it stuck around. It is a persistent change in their search behavior. So we can do this. We can teach the world to be a better searcher. And I want to give you this, this sort of remix of Alan Toffler from 1970, that tomorrow's illiterate will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who can not learn, unlearn, and relearn. Because that Google VR thing didn't exist three years ago. It didn't exist when you were a student. When you were learning geography, it was not around. Trust me, we're not going to stop innovating new stuff. And I'm not just talking about Google, but all of us, right? So we live in a world where there's a breadth and depth of information that's unparalleled in human history, right? There's all kinds of new context, a chaotic media landscape. And search and online research can, at its best, lead the savvy to a deeper and more nuanced understanding of the world. But at its worst, it can lead students to this kind of collection and a trivial view of the world, most of it spectacularly wrong, sensationalistic, and untrue. But there are ways we see new literacies arising. And that's why I think we, as a collection of people, need to actually figure out how to teach these online research skills. And it's not just to pump up my, my Google product. You can use Bing. I don't care. Right? But you need to know how to separate the goats from the sheep, the untrue from the sensationalistic, and the factual and what's credible. Thank you very much.